we're joined by Keith Camito. It's this is Levin Jewel School today. We're going to be learning a lot about biology and science. Uh, Keith's with a company called Lifespan.io. It's a nonprofit for crowdsourcing the cure to aging, which is a lot less far fetched than it might sound to some of you. And unfortunately, I'd wear my dunce cap, but it would not fit on the screen compared to the amount of knowledge this guy has. Aging is a accumulation of damage in the cells. There's seven types of damage. So the cure to aging is an engineering problem. And Keith's on the front lines here. Uh, he educates people and also works in the field and raises money to tackle some of these pro uh, challenges and problems. Uh, Keith, thank you so much for joining us. Uh, thanks for having me. And it's, it's going to be hard to live up to that, that uh, massive hype that Lev just laid on me. Uh, <laughs> but we'll see how we do. But yeah, so just to kind of clarify um, what you said there, um, I'm a president of a nonprofit, uh, the Life Extension Advocacy Foundation. And the kind of main project that we're known for is Lifespan.io, which is this crowdsourcing, crowdfunding hub for research into overcoming the diseases of aging. And that entails not just raising money, but raising awareness, uh, engaging the press and the public in dialogue and everything else that you know comes along with that. How long have you been working at Lifespan? So we, uh, I was one of the co-founders as well, and we founded uh, LEAF, uh, the organization behind Lifespan, uh, in 2014, and then we kind of officially became known to the world, I would say, in, in like April 2015, around there. So I've seen your stuff advertised on the Young Turks. You even had a feature where you were there talking with Sank, um, and you've been advertising with them or promoting through them for a while. That's not the first time you've been featured there. Uh, right. So it, it's not like any kind of official like advertiser type relationship. They're just one example of how we were trying to reach out um, to all kinds of media outlets. So, you know, to go on both sides of the spectrum, you know, Oliver, our vice president last year was also on Fox News, you know, so he's on that side as well. And, you know, I was on the Young Turks, which you're mentioning. Uh, that was an interview on their uh, Rebel Headquarters segment. Um, in September, I believe, no, November, actually. And that was just, uh, it was very interesting because this is part of our broader mission of, you know, connecting with anyone who has an audience that might be interested in learning more. And uh, one interesting kind of moment that happened there was in that interview, I had brought up um, the topic of the gray tsunami, as it's sometimes called, which is a demographic shift that's happening in the world, uh, particularly in Japan right now, which is sort of like the canary in the coal mine here, where um, you know, the baby booming uh, generation is getting older, but the fertility, uh, fertility rates for the younger population is, is going down and down. So demographics are skew, skewing older. So you can see how this would uh, cause potential problems for social safety net systems, you know, like Social Security or Medicare, et cetera. So the, the factors, statistic that I brought up during that call with Jenk was, uh, I think starting maybe five years ago, more adult diapers are being sold in Japan than oh. baby diapers. Hmm. That, that's just a good example of like, you know, when you hear something like that, you know, most people who are, who may not understand, you know, population demographics will be like, what? <laughs> you know, it's like, it's such a shocking fact. And I think we need, that's one of the tools in our tool bag is, you know, like how do we come up with these very interesting, understandable at a glance that someone could then go look up on their own and verify and go, Oh my God. Okay. You know, I thought like, overpopulation was going to be an issue, but actually it might be underpopulation that's an issue. Wow, you know, I had this really wrong, you know, that sort of thing. Um, or when it comes to both having a role where you have overpopulation on uh, one side and then you have underpopulation on the other side. Unfortunately, the other side may be what Mike Judge was uh, showing in his movie Idiocracy, where the people who are actually, you know, pretty smart – they save for having kids for a rainy day, and then eventually they never even get around to it. But the folks who have loads of kids, unfortunately, the, most of them just uh, statistically aren't going to be the brightest uh, bulbs in the attic. And as a result, that world that he portrayed had a lot of stupid people there with a lot of this technology that was sort of babying them around, making sure that they don't get into trouble, even though they definitely did get into trouble. So that's a future that I want to avoid. But uh, back to the subject of the Japanese people. To get Mr. Miyagi out of his diapers, are we at the point, technologically speaking, that a lot of the unfortunate effects of aging is going to be able to be 
reversed for somebody who is, let's say, in their 70s or 80s. Right. So obviously, when you try to get into hard predictions of, you know, what's going to happen, in, you know, for this generation, etc., uh, I say it's still a little too early to come up with anything exact. So you have to, you know, caveat everything by saying it's it's speculation. But what I can say is that over the last 10 years and increasingly so with each year in, in recent history, uh, you know, including last year where a lot of developments happened, we are rapidly approaching a shift in just biotechnology in general, where aging is increasingly being seen as something that one is feasible to work on. And two, almost kind of more importantly, is a more effective route to pursue when it comes to solving the other problems we've been trying to solve. Anyway, like, let me give you one example. So uh, cancer, right? So, you know, cancer, it's kind of like autism or, or other things. It's easy to just use the one big word and say that describes everything. But cancer is a multi-headed hydra, right? So if you look at it, you know, in the past, not that, uh, I want to poo-poo on, you know, the war on cancer because, yeah, people critique that it wasn't as effective as it could have been, but, I mean, it gets the ball rolling. It get you know, great, go for it. But it's worth noting that, you know, you're spending all this money on maybe different end-stage variations of cancer. But it's easy to see just kind of like mathematically, logically, well, you know, what are the common causes of all cancers, you know, things like genetic instability, you know, damage that builds up in the, in the DNA that can cause mutations that will cause a lot of cancers, you know, and like, is there, is it smarter? I would say yes, uh, that, you know, let's work on that. Let's try to solve genetic instability. And then you get much more bang for your buck when it comes to curing cancers and also a lot of other things because genetic instability is one of those hallmarks that Jules mentioned at the top of the call. You know, these seven to nine, you know, there's a little bit of disagreement in the field of like, you know, the precise uh, tent pole items there. But there's the, the main issue here is that while the diseases of, myri uh, of uh, aging are myriad, you know, a billion different things, the things that cause those diseases are actually relatively few, you know, seven to nine ish types of damage like genetic instability or genetic damage that build up in your body and accumulate that cause those pathologies. So it's just smarter to let's move our focus to that part of the hierarchy. Mm. But for but for a while, we're not going to be able to have a Benjamin Button type situation, you'd say? Um, I would say that what we're going to start to see in the near term, um, like in the next five years or so, is there are certain types of aspects of aging that might be low hanging fruit that could give you some benefit. So for example, uh, you know, you guys have probably all heard of resveratrol, you know, the stuff in red wine, mm -hmm. you know, th there's, there's a an interesting story there that, you know, your viewers can look up where, you know, it was seen as the Holy grail and then, they, Oh, it doesn't do anything. And then it might do something, but not the way we thought, you know, and kind of oscillates. Right. But there are things like that, things that are involved in a pathway that's related to, uh, I'm not sure. Have you guys talked uh, on your show about calorie restriction before ever? If we have briefly. Sure. So just to sum this up super quick, you know, there's been some experiments going back, you know, a good while that seem to indicate that if you have a restricted calorie diet, you know, 70% or something of what you would normally conceive of as your diet, it seems to have a, a pro longevity effect. And it was seen in primates, um, you know, seen through, seen um, in much more pronounced in small organisms uh, you know, where the effect could be huge, you know, for example, in roundworms, C. elegans, you know, modifications like this might, you know, 10x the lifespan of, of a nematode, you know. Um, so anyway, this pathway, this calorie restriction pathway was very interesting uh, to people. And then a lot of people don't want to go through the hassle of trying to, you know, undernourish themselves essentially, right? Because it's difficult and people like food, right? Sure. <laughs> so <laughs> um, then there, the, the next wave of that was, you know, are there supplements that we can take or, or other modifications that we can do to our diet that would create the same sort of response without having to restrict calories? And this is where resveratrol and some other um, compounds like uh, nicotinamide that are out there now um, 
are, are seeking to address. They kind of piggyback on the same pathway. That in turn also relates actually directly to tie it back to the earlier part of the conversation, genetic instability and genetic repair mechanisms. So the point is, is that these things are things that are being worked on right now. There's supplements that you can buy. Um, but my opinion is that if they have a, like that alone may give you a very mild kind of 2% hmm. uh, longevity, you know, but these are the things that we can start to see happening now. But the, oh, sorry. Well, there was a research by Dr. Walter Longo with uh, rats showing their lifespan increasing up to uh, 40%. But what I'm curious about is whether we could have the similar benefits, not so much from caloric restriction, because they were doing experiments in the uh, 1940s, I believe, with caloric restriction. Although what they used in place of the normal calories were things like pasta, you know, and bad things like that. I, I know, I know. Hey, but, I'm uh, Italian. <laughs> yeah, yeah, what are you going to do? But... Uh, the thing that I'm curious about here is whether fasting or intermittent fasting would be able to deliver the same kind of effect, but because I've read that it does have the ability for the immune system to reset itself. The, the answer there is it is certainly worth looking into. And Volter Longo is actually on our advisory board at LEAF. Oh, um, nice. So what's super interesting, and again, I'm not sure what the exact latest on this is, but another sort of side effect of that is – People have been really looking at di uh, diseases like diabetes in the context of aging, right? And how it might actually be related to other diseases of aging. So, for example, um, sometimes there's a connection that's being drawn with things like Alzheimer's disease and diabetes. Like Alzheimer's, in a sense, might be kind of like a type 3 diabetes. Like the same sort of things going, going wrong, but in different places of the body or further along. But what if I remember this right, uh, one of the shockingly interesting things about uh, Walter Longo's uh, fasting uh, approaches was, I believe there was like a shocking claim in there somewhere where it's like, this could cure your diabetes, like full stop. By by fasting long enough, it would I believe it was something like this where the you know, it would cause the beta islet cells in the pancreas to sort of like uh, apoptose to, to self-destruct and new fresh beta islet cells to uh, emerge that then would produce insulin properly or something like that. Uh, again, I'm not sure what the latest is on that, but yeah, if that works, that would certainly have uh, some longevity benefit, of course, right? Because if you're curing diseases that are, you know, hallmark diseases of aging, then you're, you're going to get some lifespan benefit out of that assuming you don't get eaten by a bear or some other disease doesn't kill you first. <laughs> <laughs> I, I remember in the documentary Transcendent Man, a trans, how, what is it? Trans, Transcendent Man, yes. the Ray Kurzweil documentary. Yes. He, he was diagnosed with type 2 diabetes, and then he did a system shock. He takes 200 supplements or more a day, and he – according to him, rewired his biology with this excessive amount of vitamins and whatever else was in his regimen. And he says he's effectively like removed diabetes from his profile. That is possible, but here are my like caveats and don't get me wrong. I respect uh, uh, Ray Kurzweil's work. Um, but the cautionary points that I would throw out here is I would say that the field is not sufficiently there yet in two ways to, to, to make that claim uh, for this reason. One is that, well, maybe for diabetes specifically, perhaps, but as far as aging, one of the things that the field needs uh, and is being worked on now is biomarkers of aging. You need to be able to know um, you know, it, I think that turmeric is going to make me live longer and healthier does it? <laughs> you know, you could do an experiment, you know, a full on clinical trial, but one for things that are uh, generally recognized as safe already, you know, like strawberries, you know, that have a uh, fisetin in it, which may be good for you. You know, no one's going to patent strawberries, right? So big pharma doesn't really have an incentive to run a 40 year clinical trial to see if people who were mega dosing strawberries are actually living longer. Cause that's the problem with longevity compared to other diseases in clinical trials is that your endpoint is like, when do you die? And when you're dealing with humans, that means you're running a 50-year trial. So the answer to that is we need to come up with, as a field, accurate proxies for you're doing it. 
that your longevity is better, right? And what's interesting here is that what's turning out to be the case is, at least for right now, you know, we're working on, or the field is working on a lot of, you know, blood biomarkers and, and more complicated diagnostics, uh, epigenetic changes, uh, Horvath's epigenetic clock, if you've heard of that. But right now, some of the best biomarkers that we have are things like grip strength and walking speed, how many stairs per day, your activities of daily living, you know, can you go to the bathroom by yourself? It sounds trivial. Uh, one of the best one, ones to detect mortality is literally how easily you can get up from a cross leg position. Mm. You know, like I, I do that all the time just yeah. to test myself, make yeah. sure I'm still, I still have uh, some uh, time left. <laughs> yeah. So uh, to give some context to your viewers here. So what that might mean is, you know, uh, you know, I, I have a pretty uh, solid martial arts background, so I'm good on this test. Yeah, you toot my own horn. You know, if you're in a cross-like position, you know, if you could just sort of like spring up magically, you know, that's a perfect score, right? But, you know, say you got to put your hand on your knee or, you know, you got to lean on something, you know, like every time you would do that, you'd like lose a point and then you'd get some score. And if I remember right, there's like no better predictor on whether you're going to die in five years than like how, how, how well you do on that. Uh, wow, that's amazing. So, wow. <laughs> So, but to bring it back to your answer is that that's great, right? But you can see how the more cumbersome the tests are, the harder it is to make it like automated as part of a trial, right? So we want to get better and better. You know, you can see how there might be, um, you know, an iPhone application that combines a lot of um, interesting biomarkers. So on Lifespan.io, our crowdfunding platform where we support aging projects, we also had in the past uh, couple of years, a couple of biomarker projects. So let me just give you an example here, a concrete example. One of them was called the age meter. And it was essentially, think of it for simplicity's sake, like an iPhone app where it does all kinds of simple tests like, you know, visual reaction time, auditory reaction time, you know, how quickly you respond and, and hit on things, you know, how quickly your eyes work to determine, you know, where things are, that sort of stuff. Uh, and we did another project called Mouse Age that was funding uh, a machine learning algorithm that would basically... This was for mice, but you could basically train a machine learning algorithm that based on a picture of a mouse, uh, it would tell you how physiologically old it was. So you could see how useful that is in a clinical trial, right? Because if you, if you know how biologically old, you know, just time-wise, chronologically old a mouse is, and then through, its, through taking pictures of it every day, based, uh, compared to baseline, you can see from your picture results that it looks younger or it looks older really you know how much fur it has the color of the fur you know uh that tells you something that's a proxy for aging that's very useful just like if you think about it think about regular people you know that that's that there is value to that you look at someone and go oh that person's aging poorly or, or that person is oh wow they look great for their age that is a reasonable proxy for how physiologically young or old they are. So you can see if we do that also for faces now, if we had an iPhone app that can assess your face, can assess your reaction time, and then you're using that as a test for whatever, your turmeric supplement over a period of a couple of years. I think you see, I'm being a little bit long-winded, but you can see where I'm going, where if you have better markers that are proxies for aging and pair that with clinical trials, you can start to get re meaningful results faster and iterate on them. And that's a, a key piece of the puzzle that needs to be worked on, biomarkers what, of aging. What are some of our best biomarkers right now? I'm familiar with telomeres, which I understand is the plastic tips on the shoelaces of your DNA. That's good. That's close enough for jazz. <laughs> Okay. <laughs> but yeah, yeah. so uh, basically to, to give a little more detail there, that's again, a good enough uh, approximation for, for the purposes. So it's basically that um, at the ends of your chromosomes, so, you know, think of like your X and your Y chromosomes, you know, what your viewers might not know what that actually means, because I actually didn't really know exactly what a chromosome was until maybe a few years ago where, you know, you see the picture of DNA, it's a double helix, right? Everyone knows what that looks like from high school bio class. But basically, when, it, when information is being read off your genome, your DNA is kind of like in a free-floating expanded state so that, you know, the little reading machines can go in there, right? But when that's not happening, when your cell's not dividing or something like that, you know, think of it like that double helix sort of coils up into like a rope, right? And then if you think of the X chromosome, like that's what that is. It's like wound up DNA, you know into that format, right? And then every time a cell divides, um, 
in the copying process, there's like a bit of an error where it can, you know, just by the physical way that it works, it can copy everything except where it's kind of like sitting on, like the ends. So because of that, your chromosomes have like repeating nonsense at the ends because, oh, that it won't matter if it fails to copy that part. But then every time it copies, uh, a little bit of that gets chopped off. And then after 70 or so cell divisions, those telomeres, those, that's what it is. They're not really shoelace caps. They're, you know, these repeating patterns at the end of quote unquote meaningless DNA that are okay to be chopped out. But then once you hit the last part of it, now you're chopping out meaningful stuff. And that's why after about 70 cell divisions, uh, you know, it doesn't work anymore. You know, the, the spool unravels if you, if you want to think of the, you know, the shoelace um, analogy. So that's a quick primer on, you know, what telomeres actually are. It wasn't exactly the original question. We can go back to uh, biomarkers if you want to, but hopefully, did that make sense? <laughs> that, that was very helpful. And I think because for a lot of people who are so new to this, people have been hearing stories about the fountain of youth, or the holy grail. And I think this is nothing new for people as a, like, as subject matter. Only what's new is the scientific advancements that are being made. And I know I've learned a lot from hearing people emphasize the difference between health span and lifespan, that the age, your physical age, the number matters a lot less than what your biological age is. You might have been alive for 40 years and your biological age could be 30 or 60, depending on are you smoking three packs a day and or exercising. And I think a lot of people, when they hear conversations trying to extend life, it's this is the kind of thing that we feel like we've gotten past, but it's always important to reemphasize that we're not trying to get everyone to live like the crypt keeper for 600 years. It's about... Uh, it's about it's a maintain it's a maintenance and engineering problem. Like if you had a car from 1970, you could look at it today, and if it was well maintained, it'll look brand spanking new. And if it's been abandoned, it could be defunct with the tires missing and rusting away, and it'll look like it's a hundred years old. Yeah, I would actually say that this issue is the most important issue for advocates of a healthy life expectant or health healthy lifespan to to speak about because it's one of the largest misconceptions you know you brought up the crypt keeper right and this actually goes way way further back you know the, the first example that i can think of of this clearly is the greek myth of tythonus right where uh to sum it up you know there was a goddess aos the goddess of dawn which is probably why the camera company is called that or the, there is a camera called eos right um where she was in love with a mortal, right? And she wanted to be in love with him forever. So she goes to ask Zeus, I think, you know, can you make him immortal so that we can be together forever? But maybe because Zeus is, you know, partly, uh, you know, a troll <laughs> or, you know, uh, you know, because she didn't remember to ask that he stay young forever, uh, Zeus granted the wish, but Tythonus just kept getting older and older and older over the years until eventually I think he shrivels up into like the size of like a pea with a beard and just like babbling <laughs> incoherently for like all of existence, right? So, <laughs> you know, that whenever someone sort of brings up this topic, I always think of the Greek myth of Tythonus is like, that's what people are very rightly afraid of. Like the, the way that I kind of suss this out, this crosses over into the topics of cognitive biases, but you know, I'll leave that to the side for right now. But, you know, I'll ask someone, you know, do you want to live to be 150 years old? And right away, most people would say, like, no way. And where I think some transhumanists might go wrong here in that dialogue is like, at that point, some transhumanists will be like, oh, this person is just an idiot. They don't get it and make the person feel bad or stupid because they just don't get it, right? But the real thing to realize is that based on the way things have worked up until now and the way the current healthcare system is, that person's knee-jerk response is completely correct because <laughs> they, will, they will rightly think in their mind like a hundred-year-old decrepitude, like persisting, hooked up to machines and like nobody wants that. You were right <laughs> to not want that. It is on us to be able to explain, no, the 
only way that you're actually ever going to be able to live to 150 years old is if we actually extend the period of health and youth and compress the period of morbidity, as they call it. And that nightmare scenario that people are worried about, ironically, is what's being maximized by the healthcare system as it is right now. And what we're trying to do is fix that problem. <laughs> I'm trying to shift the paradigm. Yeah. But, you know, you want to, ma- like you said, you want to maintain yourself in good condition, not try to maintain yourself in the agonizing position, right? And what's interesting to note here that's also a failure on some uh, communicators is that it's also a statistical issue. Like, here's an example that I use sometimes. Let's say right now, you're 100 years old, Jules, with medicine as it is now. So you're probably not in very good shape. Even if I or Aubrey de Grey with his wizard beard comes along and his, his magic and makes you frozen as far as aging right now. So you've, you've aged to 100 and now your aging has stopped. Right now, you're still going to probably die within five years because you're super frail. You're going to get pneumonia. You're going to fall and break your hip and get an infection. It, you know what I mean? So even if your, your aging was stopped, if you're not healthy, you're never going to be able to live to be 200 years in that position because you're frail, right? And the only way to extend health span or extend lifespan really is to extend health span. And that's like the most important issue because the knee jerk response is usually like thinking of the crypt keeper, like you said, and that is completely the opposite of what we're basically doing. What are some of the latest measures that could be put in place for somebody who is in their 70s, let's say, like my uh, grandma is, to reverse certain conditions having to do with uh, bone loss or um, the uh, problems with the knees that occur, you know, very, uh, what do you call it, the meniscus uh, getting a little torn apart a little bit. Like those conditions of the meniscus, I know that stem cell surgery is available to uh, treat it and to have the meniscus grow back. But as far as something like bones go, like I could take a supplement for it and it'll keep my bones in certain condition. But as far as undoing the softness of the bones that occurs for older people, what's the latest there? So that's actually kind of a loaded question. It has a lot of different aspects to it. So I'm going to try to take them each in turn if I can remember them. So uh, as sort of the broad answer, I'll answer the specifics, but in Mm -hmm. the the broad case, um, obviously right now, you know, I would say in, in 30, 50 years, we're going to have technologies and uh, therapies that will be able to reverse your aging, you know, fix the damage that has already accumulated. I think some of that is on the horizon. I will mention one in a little while. Um, But for right now, it's super important to try to be as upstream in the process as possible, right? So just to be completely honest, if we're talking about like are we gonna uh, are we gonna live to be 500 years? I'm just picking out this number randomly. I'm not saying anything sensational, but like you know, someone who's 20 years old now is gonna have a much better chance of that happening for them than someone who's 80 years old now, right? Because they've already built up a lot of damage, and our ability to reverse damage that has already happened is gonna come after our ability to kind of stabilize the situation, right? So, but let me give you one cause for hope. (laughs) Uh, One uh, track of therapy right now that's quickly becoming all the rage and is starting to actually radiate out into uh, like kind of mainstream news to some degree is uh, senolytics. Are you guys familiar with this at all? Okay. Mm -hmm. So it's actually very interesting and I like to talk about it because it's actually one of these things that has clear analogies that make it easy to understand. So one of the things that goes wrong with you as you age is you build up this burden of cells that enter what's called senescence. So it's basically kind of uh, inactive. They're not dividing out of control like cancer. It's the opposite. They don't divide anymore. They don't really do anything useful. They, for all intents and purposes, they enter a zombie state and like a zombie, they don't procreate in the normal sense like humans do, you know, or they don't divide anymore. But they sort of secrete these uh, toxic chemicals, uh, one, you know, uh, SASP is what it's called. You know, I forget the acronym right now. Uh, and they can sort of turn their neighbors into zombies too over time. So basically what happens is as you get older and older, you build up this burden of do-nothing zombie cells throughout the body. And this is increasingly becoming implicated as one of these key hierarchy points that I was talking about 
uh, at the top of the call that like may be responsible for like many diseases. For example, this may be one of the reasons why your immune system gets less and less effective because a lot of your immune cells are becoming like soldiers that are just sitting on the barracks and doing nothing, right? <laughs> so anyway, there are this there are these class of small molecules uh, therapies that, that are being called senolytics. Uh, cu uh, lysis is cutting, so it's like killing senescent cells. So cells are supposed to kill themselves when they enter a state like this. It's called apoptosis. Um, but as you get older, you know, some of them don't, and that's why you're building up these cells. So there's these drugs, uh, and sometimes even just regular things that are in food, like fisetin in strawberries, which I mentioned earlier that seem to be able to now tell these cells that didn't commit suicide like they should have to now do so and then clear out of the body, right? So the point is, is that if these senolytics can work, if you do something like taking a course of senolytics that clears out all the junk cells in the body and then maybe pair that with some near-term future uh, therapy like an infusion of you know, your own stem cells that you've banked and grown or something like that. In a sense, clearing out the old, putting in the new, right? That could be a very powerful way to start to rejuvenate some damage that has already happened. So, and that, that's like, again, starting to hit some mainstream news. There was a company called Unity, uh, for example, that has uh, one particular senolytic therapy that raised, I believe, uh, over 100 probably maybe over 200 million, but we're in the hundreds of millions of dollars last year. Like that's how much attention this track is starting to gain from the investment world. Where does it go in the human body? Is it an injection? Is it a pill? How do you, how do you use it? Well, for example, uh, fisetin and strawberries, you eat it, <laughs> you know, that, that's it. Uh, now you probably have to eat like 1800 barrels of it, but some of the, that's, that's the interesting thing about some aspects of potential anti-aging therapies that it might be low hanging fruits, I guess, pun intended, <laughs> um, where, uh, again, you know, it's hard, you're going to be hard pressed to find Merck or big pharma or whatever to do a clinical trial on a lot of strawberries, right? Cause where's the money to be made in that? But this is to, to tie it back to kind of what we're doing. This is a potential future of what we're seeing with maybe lifespan.io where thus far we've been, doing a lot of social outreach endeavors, you know, talking to the press, crowdfunding some money for research itself. But you can see how, you know, there might be a way to structure what you could consider a crowdsourced clinical trial if you've done it in the right way, right? You, you know, have, I'm, I'm being glib here, I'm, I'm, you know, making it up a little bit, you know, you have everybody with their barrel of strawberries, <laughs> you know, you have them recording themselves, ingesting it every day so you can monitor what the dose is, you know, you pair it with the physiological biomarkers that I was talking about earlier, you know, and you package everything together in the right way where the FDA will say, you know what, okay, this is going to pass statistical muster, this would pass, uh, you know, uh, industrial uh, IRB uh, review boards, etc. There's some work to be able to do that in the right way because it's a paradigm shift, kind of similar to how blockchain is a financial paradigm shift. Mm -hmm. But this is something that we're working on. We're talking to people in the government. We're talking to, you know, some of the best researchers in the field. Like, you know, can we get something going on, like a crowdsourced clinical trial for these potentially low-hanging fruit that may actually remediate the damage of da aging, like right now, without any new technologies? So... That gives me a lot of hope. And as far as things that people are utilizing right now for uh, more serious uh, pressing matters like cancers, these are purely anecdotal situations, but they're people who I've been communicating with through email, like this one guy who was talking about how he had a uh, neuroblastoma, stage four brain cancer. His doctor told him that hopes aren't high for him living. What he ended up doing was condensed five pounds of cannabis into oil that he orally took. The cancer went into remission and he's been completely cancer free ever since. His doctor was shocked. She didn't know what happened and she never believed him when he told her that, oh, this is because I concentrated cannabis into this form. These are not tests from what I understand that anybody's doing at all related to cannabis. It's more just like some people smoking here and there or vaporizing or taking a couple of edibles, but this is like high dose concentrate. This is something that has to be looked into. Yeah. Um, did he, I'm sorry to interject. Did he do other things? Did he do chemo or was that the only therapy he did? I believe so. He did not do chemo. 
Well, that's a big thing because I, I mentioned that to some people and they were very skeptical. And when I told them I thought that was the only therapy he did because that's what you told me, they were in extreme disbelief. They well, To speak to this, it's like I would be – very skeptical myself, but also very open-minded, right? Because things can combine and do things in strange ways. You know, even I think ever since back into like ancient Greece, you know, uh, I'm not sure if it was Hippocrates or like one of these guys, you know, they noticed something weird that then turned out to be true. Like sometimes if you have like a really wicked fever, it would like help destroy cancer because some kind of weird combination happened there where this sort of virus was attacking the cancer you know you never know right but the so i would say it's plausible what happened there but the issue and it also teases out the issue here is that especially in the age of the internet where people can kind of look up what therapy is you know you have all these like forums online that are dedicated to people sort of like supplement junkies you know or like neurotropics or like you know i'm going to take eight parts adderall and this part this and you know this is my experience and yeah you know it's great or not you know there's a lot of this going on and you know what you'd call that in, in the math world or whatever or you know is a n equals one trial you know like i am one person doing the study on myself which doesn't mean that it might not work, but unfortunately what that means is you can't really get any meaningful data out of that because people aren't on the same protocol. People could be doing some other things, you know, they're doing some other, you know, this person sleeps 20 hours a day and this person sleeps five hours a day, you know, and it's throwing off your results. So that again ties into what I was mentioning before is that in my opinion, I'm getting a little bit like this is my perspective, man. You know, I'm not necessarily speaking for uh, Leaf or, you know, all of the biotech industry or anything. But from my perspective, it looks like there's a couple of problems that are feeding off of each other right now. Where, one, there are probably a lot of things that may be efficacious against aging and other things that there's just no profit motive for. The strawberry stuff that I was mentioning before, right? Because you can't patent it or whatever, right? So you got that. You have a lot of people because of the internet getting smart uh, as far as what they may be able to do themselves, but they're generating data that's unusable, like we just talked about, N equals one. And on the other side of this, you have things like your general multivitamins that everyone is conditioned to take. I still take Centrum because I was brainwashed by the Flintstones kids, right? <laughs> but in general, the regular multivitamins do pretty much nothing for you unless you're deficient in something, right? So the point is, you can see how if you take those three together, the solution that I was potentially bringing up before or I was bringing up as a potential solution could maybe hit those three things, right? You have a crowdsourced clinical trial for something that doesn't have a traditional profit motive, right? The crowd in a sense becomes the profit motive by crowdfunding it or crowdsourcing it, right? And then you have a clear protocol that everyone follows that you ensure they adhere to by them recording themselves or whatever, right? Mm -hmm. So you solve the N equals one problem. And then you hopefully find things that are actually efficacious. And then you can make a vitamin that actually makes you live longer. <laughs> you know, like there's a way to, you know, all the pieces are there in my mind. It's just like, how do we arrange them in the right way to actually do something useful? I have a, I have a question. Um, it's kind of a PR question because I learned that penicillin was discovered hundreds of years, no exaggeration, before it became widespread and used. And it seemed like the reason why penicillin didn't become more popular quickly was because it was bad PR and that the information wasn't cir circulating and that you'd have people at colleges or academies, renowned doctors who would look at this anomaly and say, I would know better, right? I would, if, if this is true, I would know. Therefore, this is bunk, ignore it. And, you know, and then it, like, because if you look at Wikipedia, it'll even say penicillin was discovered much later than it was actually discovered. That, uh, I'm not sure as to the specifics of that particular case. I do know, I think penicillin was sort of maybe in the modern discovery, discovered sort of by accident because of mold growing on a Petri dish or something like that. Uh, so I don't know how this relates to that story, but that sounds plausible to me. But what I will say is that this is what I would think the best 
incarnation of the internet can solve, right? Is that the information will be there for people to pick up dropped balls quickly instead of it taking 200 years. So to give an example, I was just watching like a documentary with my father actually on quantum mechanics. Uh, it's something that I like to think about uh, as well. And uh, it was telling me something that I didn't know that, you know, there was this argument going back and forth in the forties or whatever with Einstein and Niels Bohr about some aspects of quantum mechanics. And then this one researcher, I forget his name, um, basically kind of solved the problem that they were arguing or had, you know, had a really good proof of something, but he published it in some, you know, not reputable or, or not mainstream journal. And it literally was just like collecting dust on a shelf for like 30 years. And then like in the eighties, some other researcher just like found it was like, Holy shit, you know, and then like, you know, wrote it. <laughs> and, then, and, then, and then the conversation was like picked up again, you know? <laughs> so it's like, you want to compress uh, that, cycle as fast as possible. <laughs> oh, it, uh, it reminds me of this uh, quote, the easiest person to rob from is a thief. And in this example, the thief would be all the people who are in these hierarchies of medicine, health, psychology, all of these industries that have to uh, do something that's going to appeal to the people who are above them and are just stuck in this certain system where they're already satisfied with knowing whatever it is that they happen to have learned in college. And then that said, there's no time to learn anything new. And even if I did, it would only contradict what I know now. So why would I do it? Why would I ruin my cushy job and the connections that I have to people whose reputations depend on certain ideas being correct? I don't know how much of it is present today. I know that back during the time when people said that fat was bad for you, there weren't a lot of detractors from that dogma. Well, I mean, the thing here is, you know, I don't want to be too pessimistic. Uh, I tend to be optimistic uh, as far as science and scientists are concerned, right? But to your point, you know, there are some issues that you have to watch out for, some influences that you have to watch out for, right? So obviously, we have to try as a scientific community to insulate the effect of political machinations and money, right? So, you know, like climate change is a good example. I don't want to get too political, but you know, you always look to see who's funding the research, you know, and you'll find a lot of like an astonishingly high number of cases of like, oh, hey, you know, we did this study and determined that this chemical is awesome. And it was funded by the company that makes that chemical. Who knew, you know, <laughs> stuff like that, you know, you gotta, we have to build our system in such a way that clearly recognizes, all right, you know, that's that's the situation there so everyone be advised <laughs> you know that sort of stuff but i would say that the scientific community at large you know your the the people that you know and love um especially in biotech scientists tend to be a pretty i don't necessarily mean this politically but tend to be a conservative bunch as in you know things move slowly like the, the famous quote you know what is it uh science advances Blank. one funeral at a time right <laughs> um and not, i don't think that's necessarily a good thing but the point is is that the scientific community is generally not one that's making radical wild changes here and there due to any kind of influence it moves very slowly and you know uh but the another issue there is um you know how do we make sure that we solve systemic problems that are very real. So one that you might not be aware of, but I think is hugely related. You know, I've, I've listened to some of the previous shows here and I, I can tell uh, some of the things that you're worried about, uh, Lev. Um, and one of the things that I think you should have on your radar here is, um, did you see the documentary that came out a couple of weeks ago or maybe a couple of months ago called Paywall, The Business of Scholarship? Nope. Okay, so look that up. Uh, you know, your viewers mm -hmm. can write that down as well. Um, this is something that we kind of supported. It wasn't directly related to life extension, but you know, we're a big we're big advocates at Leaf and Lifespan.io for you know open science and all that stuff. So we supported this documentary and helped uh, the filmmaker make some connections. But basically, the point here is that the current journal system is messed up. In that, for a lot of research, the money comes from you and me comes from the taxpayer public money to conduct research at universities that's being you know given grant money money you know the nsf the nih etc right but then the results of that research sometimes gets published only in very expensive journals that you have to pay a lot of money and research institutions the colleges themselves also have to pay a lot of money 
for subscriptions. So basically, a lot of the scientific community has been sort of circumventing this over the last couple of years using basically a pirate bay for journal papers called SciHub. Um, and you can find that information on this on Lifespan.io if you search for SciHub, S-C-I Hub, because we've, it's really kind of a crazy story, <laughs> you know, to get into it. Like the, the woman, uh, Alexandra, I think, who created SciHub, she's like literally on the run. Like nobody knows where she physically is, except like one of our board members knows where she is so we can interview her. But like, you know, El Sevier and other journals are like, you know, they hate this woman for creating SciHub, mm. you know, because she's cutting into their bottom line. It's this whole big story. But like every researcher kind of uses it without really mm-hmm. like, you know, it's, it's like- It's kind a, of like an Edward Snowden or Julian Assange. Yes. So the point is that she actually got really clever with, you know, in addition to providing the service and kind of running and like the Pirate Bay, you know, the site will get shut down and then pop up in like, you know, Madagascar again, you know, like a different server, you know, this sort of whack-a-mole game. But she makes some very interesting arguments here that are like legal arguments where she says, well, actually, you know, as part of the pursuit of like life, liberty and, and happiness, uh, the people should be entitled to scientific information. And by, by gating this information that the public is paying for, you are violating their civil rights. Mm-hmm. So this is actually starting to spiral up to become a significant political issue. And like I was at the UN talking about this with the, with the filmmaker. Uh, like a couple of months ago and there are uh, some countries are like passing legislation like there's one called plan s i think i want to say in the uk or somewhere over there where they're trying to make open science publications like law so that this gating can't happen uh just you know a little bit ancillary to what we're talking about here but definitely something to kind of put on your radar that this fight is happening well this sounds very similar to uh the story of aaron swartz if you remember what happened there Mm -hmm. And unfortunately, the poor guy ended up killing himself. Oh, well, fr- from what he, that's, that's what we know. And uh, what was that what, story, Love? So it was about uh, how he got an external USB hard drive at a MIT to mirror all the uh, files that he was able to mirror. And the uh, MIT staff caught him red-handed with his, uh, as they call it, wardrobe server and called in the feds. Mm-hmm. Now, what was the information that he was taking? From what I understand, it was uh, part of a digital library called JSTOR. Oh, JSTOR. Mm-hmm. Yes. So it actually is very analogous. And yeah, I believe that yeah, he was also kind of like Alexandria, seen as sort of this rebel hero uh, for doing that. And then, as you mentioned, unfortunately, it, it had a, a bad end for him. Mm-hmm. But, yeah. But hopefully what she's doing right now is going to inspire uh, more people to uh, take up her cause. And even though this may diverge a little bit from what we were talking about before, not really. Because we are in this uh, political battle over centralization versus decentralization. Over people who want to have a top-down charge and dictate the way that people live. Like an example we could be seeing in China right now with their social credit score system. Mm -hmm. And then other people who like what me and Jules are trying to do and try to inspire and more people is to have a more bottom up approach where different people inspire each other and people work together in such a way that one big sweeping decision isn't going to affect everybody in either maybe some weird positive way, but mostly it's going to be a negative way, I think. Like any top-down decision is usually going to result in a lot of unintended consequences. So we want to mitigate those as much as possible. So so I'm very interested in some of the economics of this research. I know you've just mentioned even bureaucracy as a huge obstacle or hurdle. And I've been very interested in the systemic things that affect prices. And I'm very interested in crushing prices in this research area so that it can accelerate. And there's really counterintuitive things that I've thought of. Like if you were to get rid of real estate taxes, or if you were to set up some nuclear power plants and create effectively free energy. You could crush operating costs and things like that. So the reason why Peter Thiel might want a seasteading island to accelerate research is because he could do things to crush operating costs if he doesn't have to follow these make work protocols required by 
government, the FDA, things like that. So I've been very interested in learning legal arguments to like, how do we get rid of the FDA altogether? How do we just get rid of the real estate taxes altogether? How do we make one of these nuclear plants? So based on what you and Lev just said, I I just had like a breadcrumb list of like five different important areas over here. (laughs) So hopefully I can keep them all in RAM. Uh, But yeah, this is, this is again, a very uh, important topic to talk about. But as far as what you mentioned, uh, I would say, uh, starting with Jules here, the make work aspect is very real and is very much the problem with American healthcare. Uh, You know, this is why um, our healthcare costs are, you know, twice as much as uh, some European countries for worse outcomes. It's because we have so many men in the middle or women in the middle or uh, organizations in the middle uh, that are jacking up prices. You know, the government for uh, crazy reasons is not able to negotiate drug prices, you know, so like all kinds of crazy things and price gouging happens, et cetera, et cetera. And that's a massive problem. We got to fix that. That's partly addressed by the people that are advocating for, you know, a single payer system, uh, Medicare for all. I'll circle back to that, but now I want to jump to one of the things that that Lev said, um, is that the economics aspect of this and the hierarchy aspects of this is important to address because this is another one of these like tentpole criticisms to bring it back to life extension that people have. We go, oh, you know, this is is only going to be for the rich, right? Or like, you know, we don't want to exacerbate, you know, make it even worse. You know, it becomes a zero sum game that people are afraid of, right? Where the real answer, you know, I, I don't think that's the case at all, but the answer to it is what you were talking about. It's decentralization. It's bottom up. So like, let me give you one sort of contrived made up example. You know, you always hear these stories about like the evil empires like Monsanto, you know, making the seeds that don't replicate so that they'll sell them to some starving village. And because they genetically engineered the seeds to not replicate, the starving village is going to have to keep buying more and more, right? You know, the Terminator seeds, you know, that's what they're called. You know, uh, I'm not sure if that's even true or not, uh, maybe, but here's the thing is that, okay, if CRISPR and gene sequencing and gene, uh, synthesization, you know, everything get, is getting cheaper and cheaper and cheaper, like cell phone cheap, you know, and getting even cheaper. If in two to three years, you know, it's uh, less than $100 to get a gene sequencing and gene synthesis kit where you can, okay, give me that Terminator seed. Let me sequence it. Let me see what you did with this open source knowledge and then let me fix it with CRISPR. So now it's not a Terminator seed anymore. Like I'm able to fix, you know, the little man now has the power the same power that the big man has. Or, and that's not going to, yeah. sorry, that's not going to infringe on any of their patents if you well, reverse engineer that seat. I mean, it might, but like in that, you know, in my contrived example, like are the patent lawyers going to storm, you know, the village in Papua New Guinea? Or whatever, <laughs> you know, like, <laughs> I, I don't know. Uh, you know, that's a whole other uh, issue of like how the patent system is potentially messed up. You know, I don't want to go into too mm-hmm. many rabbit holes, but um, yeah. So anyway, to bring it back to economics writ large of like, because this issue of life extension hits economic theory a lot and can invite a lot of knee-jerk criticisms. Like, oh my God, overpopulation. We talked about that a little bit before. Short answer is overpopulation is not the issue that you think it's going to be, right? And you can look into that uh, on our site or just Google it. I did a funny video about uh, using Thanos as a foil from uh Infinity War and, and how he was wrong and based on discredited research from the 1790s that everybody still parrots uh, mm-hmm. this idea that the population is going to double every 18 years. We're going to blast past the carrying capacity and crash. Not the case at all. We're already leveling off in most of the developed nations. The population starting to crash. Again, caveat in countries that aren't developed. Yes, they're still exhibiting a lot of boom, but you know, over the long arc of history, it's it's certainly not exponentiating as they, mm-hmm. they thought it was going to. Anyway, uh, so related issues here go, well, okay, say we extend healthy lifespan. Is that good or bad for the economy? What does that mean for retirement? What does it mean for social security? You know, these are, in my opinion, the right questions to ask because the question that's already answered in my mind, but maybe not to the public yet, is like, is this feasible? The answer is yes, it's feasible, it's coming. Whether it's gonna take 20 years or 50 years, or three or a hundred years. It's going to happen assuming we don't blow ourselves up, right? So given that it's going to happen, we need to accurately assess the state of affairs and go, okay, if it does happen or when it happens, is that good or bad for the economy? 
how, and if it is really good, then that should then shift our priorities and go, okay, we want to make this happen as soon as possible. So the answer, in my opinion, which is easy to see from the data, is that it absolutely is good. So let's take Social Security, for example. Uh, any system like this is predicated, uh, whether you realize it or not, but it's pretty obvious if you think about it, that there are enough young, healthy, actively producing economically members of the society to shoulder the caring for of the people that are too old and frail to work in the system anymore, right? That's what social security is. So you can see how right now where the baby boomers are all getting older and getting Alzheimer's and the fertility rates of the young people are going down, that's a time bomb. And politicians are aware of this. I've talked to numerous people on the inside. You know, there's not the political will to, to make it a sexy issue yet, but they know it's coming. Like this is an economic crisis. And it actually can prescribe um, action for, you know, people that want to do things in the world. So, for example, I don't want to get too political, but I am in favor of systems like, you know, uh, Medicare uh, for all. And I think automation is happening. So I think we need to start thinking about things like universal basic income, you know, that sort of mm -hmm. stuff. So in thinking of that, you know, it's incumbent on us that are aware of where things are going to make the case that this is economically important. Because if Medicare for all, which I think is a good thing, but if you don't pair it with healthy, productive periods of, uh, of life lengthening, it will run into a bankruptcy problem because if you're paying for everyone's health care, but now it's become super costly for healthcare because everyone's frail for 50 years, you got a real problem. So as someone who likes Medicare for all, it's incumbent for me to say, hey, this is an issue. You got to get on this now. Otherwise, you're opening yourself up for attack in 20 years. <laughs> I, I, like that you, I like that you said that because that is something that I am not optimistic about as a solution my understanding of economics, when I look at these things, any industry that you subsidize becomes artificially expensive. And when I look at big picture movements, why does China love AI and hate crypto? And when you see a lot of government distrust increasing throughout the world, people are learning more that there's things that are kind of dark and mysterious about money. We, it's not tethered to a gold standard. It's based on faith. I was just reading uh, Yuval Noah Harari's Sapiens, mm -hmm. which is really interesting. Part of me feels like it reads like a smoking gun, even though that's kind of a weird thing to say. Um, it talks a lot about food and famines and starvations and movements. And he says things like human rights are imaginary and they're not real. And there's very interesting perspectives on what the economy is because the economy is human value, right? We use money, which is credit that represents human value. But these days it's just digital numbers on a ledger, right? So the, the federal bank can issue currency in the form of just like adding zeros to a bank's ledger. They're not necessarily filling the banks with cash, but this is what causes this needless immiseration that Karl Marx would talk about, where you have inflation and taxes crushing the middle class. And I think that one of the ways to really accelerate progress would be for people to take control of the money, but I think this would be in tandem with these crowdsourcing uh, movements. So when Gavin Newsom writes Citizenville and he's lamenting government, how it's all smoke and mirrors and show and not as efficient and good as people say it is. Politicians don't own up. And when you see these case studies of crowdsourcing, you have people outperforming government significantly and they're doing it voluntarily. And I think that when you think about things like, okay, let's have Medicare for all or health care, free healthcare for all, I'd be worried about the stagnation where you, you're, I think the laws of acceleration, I think that there are people, and this is the debate that needs to happen because there's a right or a wrong answer, right? It's not like one of these agree to disagree things. There are people, economists, people from the Austrian or Chicago school that, are, that would tell you the laws of acceleration are not being met. They're being stunted. 
and it's and it's not like a small math discrepancy. They're they're saying that like we could we could be moving light years faster if the economy was baked in differently. So I understand when you're looking at the way the system is and this huge Leviathan or this Goliath scenario where it's like a huge Gordian knot. Like there's no one culprit or one linchpin to pinpoint. So like people might say, oh, like end the Fed. Well, what's the Fed really do? Why is that the culprit? It's really more of a, a starting point to pull the knot. I think, I think people who are strategists think that would be how you can unravel a lot of other things. If you take control of the money, then you can decentralize a lot more efficiently, crush prices in the market, and then like you'd see things like like this price of scorpion venom might go down uh, a whole lot. <laughs> yeah. Well, the thing that I that I think of here um, is the takeaway. I think the key takeaway from what you're saying there, I would say, is. What we need to enter our policy making much more than is currently going on and has been going on for a long time is data driven decision making. Making this, having debates about given the state of the world as it is, what should we do about it? Not debates about what the state of the world is, because we can know that. And we're having a real problem with that right now, where, you know, facts and alternative facts, not to call anybody out in particular, but it's just, there's this loss of trust in like, all the institutions, you know, even science to some degree of like, what are facts, you know, and we need to be able to clearly have, you know, in a sense, we we're talking about biomarkers before, we need the same sort of things in our policy making, like, let me just pull one example out of a hat from like many years ago. Um, I remember back when Obama was president, you know, there was uh, some debate going on about you know, would implementing a change to the payroll tax be good or not, you know, and, uh, you know, you had Obama saying, like, Oh, you know, if people get two thousand dollars more in their pockets from the payroll tax, you know, they're gonna—that's gonna become liquid and help the economy. They're gonna buy that extra Apple computer or whatever, right? And then people like Mitch McConnell were like, "No, they won't," and it's gonna be bad, right? But it's like I remember like thinking like while I was like listening to XM radio or wherever the hell I was, you know, driving, uh, hearing that, I'm like, I don't care what Obama feels is gonna happen. I don't care what McConnell feels is gonna happen. Let's do some pilot programs and see do they buy the extra computer? And then we can make an informed decision. You know, like everything's like gut feelings and stuff. Like let's get some data and make decisions based on what actually is happening. <laughs> so, Well, that's why it's good that we have uh, 50, uh, how many states do we have right now? 51? Yeah. 51. It's good that we have, look at me. See, this is why I need dunce cap to represent how well I know this stuff. Anyway, we have 51 states and all of those states could act as little incubators. Are you saying 51 things. because of Puerto Rico or Washington? Wait, Hawaii? Oh no, this is so embarrassing. 50, it's not that embarrassing if you, if you don't like yeah, I, well, I, I, exaggerate it. I was assuming you were, you were including Puerto Rico. <laughs> okay, fine. I'll include Puerto Rico. So anyway, I see these states as being little incubation chambers for various things, like we saw recently with cannabis legalization. It was tried out in Colorado. Other states are like, hey, this isn't too much of a problem. Why don't we uh, enact it? It's probably going to make us a lot of money. So similar things could happen for uh, various economic uh, procedures. I'm just really... I'm going to be very skeptical of any, like we talked about before, top-down approach, something that comes from the federal government that's going to affect a lot of people, unless it is something that's going to make those people less dependent on previously enacted processes. Well, I, I think this is all like, you know, a larger question of like, what should the role of government be, right? And in my opinion, you know, I, I, I get the sense from what you're saying that my position might be a little bit more than yours is for example like you don't want to privatize fire departments right <laughs> you know things like that or the creation of roads you know uh, i i actually think that's the direction we have to go in well then if you pissed off the guy who runs the fire department company then they can be say well we'll just let your house burn down you know what i mean like you get into some dangerous but people do that well, that's what the, that's like, what for example, like, I know people in law enforcement and stuff, like indirectly. And if they thought you were a piece of crap, 
they're not going to help you. Like it's huge. It, these are not automatons in these yeah, things. It I'm doesn't saying, matter if it's, it's government was, or private, yeah. but that's, that's the reality is people like we're taught that the government is the only way to do these things. Like I know people that if you give them the green light, they'll just come in and make it for you. Well, as long as you have, so, so, so it's not like, it's not, it's, this is not a pipe dream. Yeah, well, right. the, key, the key here is that whatever the system is, it has to have accountability to the people in a real way built into it so that... Well, they'll come in with the pitchforks. That can be the accountability. Like, I think that the whole point with the decentralization is that this is where conservatives have bad PR when they talk about state rights. State rights is the conservative version of decentralization, right? If... You know, let's say California wanted to legalize pedophilia and Texas wanted to make, you know, gay sex illegal and you just like and abortions illegal in Alabama and you've got people making cat girls in, you know, Oregon or something. The point is you'd be able to have debates on the surface a lot faster and then people would be able to move from state to state. They'd be able to complain. They'd be able to, like, the, the point is that you'd be able to accelerate the, pro, the, the whole process of culture as well. The problem with federalization is you're constantly trying to create these procrucian bed policies. If you're too tall, we cut you off at the knees so you fit in the bed. If you're too short, we're going to stretch you out so you fit on the bed. And when you look at China and what they're doing, like why are they building two giant particle colliders that are more than twice as expensive as the one in Geneva? Some people will tell you is because they see if there's a big economic collapse, which like at the same time as like agricultural failures, you'll have big snaps as in like if a bunch of people just starve to death, it won't matter because the survivors will be able to enjoy the technology and share it amongst each other more efficiently. As in, you use the lower and middle classes basically as domesticated like farm animals or slave labor. They create the value, and then you starve them to death. Like This is what some people are trying to say. Like, like When you look at what happens in Venezuela and when you look at how these things have happened, it's like these are not unpredictable things that you can look at milestones that are like moving you more and more precariously to that kind of systemic failure. And that's where when you start talking about, oh yeah, universal healthcare is a really great idea. The healthcare in Venezuela is amazing. I know people that fly to Venezuela for supreme healthcare and there are people starving to death over there. Well, I think this is, you know, a complicated issue, obviously. We've crossed over into super complex land, but that's fine. Um, what I think, though, is that it's easy to try to overgeneralize. You know, it's like you have examples of um, democracy that have done terrible things. You have examples of democracy that do great. You have examples of socialist countries that employ some aspect of socialism and are economically great and some that are economically disastrous. You know, it's, you can't just say like one thing is bad, one thing is good. It's complicated and everything is a mix. But to this point here is that I understand the desire to not have over federalization and to allow, you know, the different subdivisions of a, of a country to experiment. That's part of the reason why, you know, states' rights is a thing. And I believe that that is, you know, that, that, that is part of it. You want the states to be a test bed in, in some sense for policies, right? But I do think it's also useful to look at the metrics, the macro metrics of a system and how they might potentially be optimized and how it might not be the worst thing in the world to incentivize, maybe not force, but to incentivize things to go into a smoother way. One example here, income inequality. So, you know, you, I forget what the metric is called. You know, it's like income disparity index or something like that. You know, you can boil all that stuff down to like a, a value of like how, what the normal distribution is, right? And you know, if you look through the arc of history back from like Rome forward, like you can sort of clearly see how the cycles go. You know, it's like 
there's some revolution that puts things back to a kind of more equitable state. Things, you know, gradually spiral out of control. You know, in American recent history, it was about the 80s again, where, you know, if you remember, like, with all those antitrust laws, you know, AT&T was broken up into like nine different companies, et cetera, et cetera. But then over time, it's like those same companies sort of like re-aggregate into each other again, you know, and everything sort of like comes back and you get back to like robber baron territories. Then you have the next, you know, revolution and boom, it's like back again. So it's like this like cycle of, but we know from history that if the income disparity index gets too high, you end up with the fall of the Roman empire, right? So like my point is that you can, you can look at this from the outside from like the macro metrics and go, well, we can see that, you know, in 1960 to 1980, when the tax rate was this and that, it's like the general happiness index of society and that things were running smoothly when those indexes are in this range. So let's try to come up with policies that, you know, incentivize the index to stay in that range through normal behavior. Um, so I'm in favor of like that sort of like smart policy making. Like, let me give you one particular example here of what I think is a bad, uh, you know, c bad code in the system is the way corporations are currently defined, you know, compared to something like say a benefit corporation, if you know what a benefit corporation is, you know what a benefit corporation is. Mm -mm. So basically uh, a benefit corporation is like a regular uh, company, but in its charter, it can have other goals besides profit, you know, like we want to help the environment or whatever, but it's like written into the founding documents of the company. And what that lets the founder do is that without that, say like, I'm going to make something up, like I'm manufacturing some product, right? Uh, and I have two choices. I could use some factory that's like super bad for the environment and uh, gives me a better profit margin or one that's like marginally less profit, but you know, is great for the environment. If I make that choice and I'm in a regular corporation in very real scenarios and there's case law on this, like I could be sued as a CEO. I could be sued by my shareholders because I didn't maximize the profit. Right? So like by, ha by having a benefit corporation, you now have a legal defense to say, yes, I didn't maximize the profit, but I was filling this other goal that's built into our company charter. So it's okay. I can't be sued. So my point is like, that should be the definition of a regular company, <laughs> right? Otherwise they're just autonomous machines that are going to crush the world just to maximize profit. You know, so, so something like a uh, Apple, yeah. for instance, would yeah. not be an example of uh, that kind of company because they export to China where they've got the suicide net slave factories and it's not great. Yeah. The point is that you have a lot of people who will come in and say like, Oh, you know, like Apple is evil or whatever for doing that or whatever. And that's fine, I guess, but I don't find it to be useful. What's like the, my, my answer to that is, is like, what did you expect? It's like, mm -hmm. if, if your chess piece was designed to maximize profit at the expense of all else, chess piece is going to do what chess piece is going to do, you know? So it's like, we need to, maybe we can tweak the design of the chess pieces is basically what I'm saying. <laughs> so. Absolutely. I am in favor of doing something that's going to minimize harm to individuals, regardless of whether they're in China or Brazil or anywhere. But as far as doing that goes, I don't want the damage to be so much that the entire economy, people starting businesses, employing people, you know, like Bernie Sanders was talking about, uh, not just the billionaire millionaires and billionaires having to pay their fair share, but he was also talking about the $200,000 heirs, I guess you could say. And that includes a lot of people who have businesses who are employing people who are responsible for the economy functioning as it is. And much like you only need a little bit on the highway to create a traffic jam. I cannot imagine the kind of traffic jam that would happen from good intentions of wanting to balance it economic inequality out by doing these kind of policies. That's why the more piecemeal and the more localized I think certain things like that are done, the less we can uh, avert uh, these things from happening, especially if we're extremely confident that we have all the data that we know everything. Because like I said before, the uh, best person to rob is a thief. Yeah. This is very, this is interesting stuff. I'm, I, I think there's going to be multiple possible solutions because we're talking about two tandem problems, right? There's the economics of anti-aging and then there's the engineering of anti-aging and what will unlock the engineering 
of anti-aging is the economics. So whether it's philanthropists that are inspired and want to be pioneers uh, helping scientific discoveries, or if they're pragmatic minded and they don't want to um, financially ruin themselves for a pipe dream. I think that really understanding you, you were talking about, we have to look at the data. Well, I think it's looking at the, the, there's a lot of noise in data. Like you can, you can, it takes magnitudes more effort to refute bullshit than to generate it. But fortunately it is possible to compare things, right? And the source of your information doesn't determine its truth value. So the, the more we have trusted communities, reliable communities, voluntarist communities, people who are willing to compare information, who are looking to look at different possibilities, and the more we enable these folk to do work and to make advancements, the better off everyone will be. Like this is a social moral good, right? And this is something that everyone needs and all generations would benefit from. And I'm very passionate about the environment as well. You know, I'm like Woody Allen. I want to live forever, not through my work, but I want to live forever in my apartment. <laughs> and, <laughs> I, and, <laughs> and if you're around or so if you're planted, if you're suffocating and you can't breathe the air, if you're underwater, you know, lifespan and health span isn't going to be good. So no one wants to be neglectful of the environment. However, I do think a lot of these things are sensationalized in ways that make the conversations very emotional and hard to have, especially with people that disagree. And I feel like there's a lot of people with different pieces of the puzzle and different keys and they're just not able to collaborate effectively yet. Uh, I would agree with that. And that's why, you know, this is maybe where there's a, a difference between myself personally and maybe people like Zoltan is fan. And, you know, a little bit of difference say, between myself and someone like Gennady, who you talked to. Um, and I remember that you had brought uh, my work up in your conversation with uh, Gennady. And I'm happy to say I, I think he had a pretty accurate description of what my, my opinions were and if, if your viewers go back and watch that video um but yeah it, it was relating to this right it's that i think as healthy life expect life um extension advocates you know it's incumbent on us to to realize that there is a science to communication too there's a science to persuasion and you know for me like i don't like carl salesmanship either right but there's a way to be authentic and completely honest, but still know how, you know, which aspects of your authentic position are best to put prominent in which audience, right? Uh, so for example, you know, if you, if you were really to, you know, put a gun to my head and press me and say like, you know, Keith, do you, do you want to, do you want to live forever? Or like, do you, do you want to die? Uh, you know, if you really press me to it, you know, I would say yes, you know, in my heart of hearts, I right now, from my current perspective, I like the prospect of living indefinitely, you know, and I'm not ashamed to say that. And I think that no one should be ashamed to say, hey, look, I love life for the reasons that we've talked about earlier. I don't think it will be societally bad or economically bad if my friends and myself live longer. So yeah, I, I like that. I like the world. I want to be part of the beauty of the world for longer. I don't think that's a shameful thing, right? That being said, if I'm in a room with like politicians that are talking about, you know, uh, you know, what policies should we pass? I'm not going to be like, we need to live forever dogs. You know, <laughs> it, it's, it would be more about like, well, this is why it makes sense economically for these reasons. You, you know what I mean? So I'm not lying in any way. I'm still being honest, but you know, it's the right part of the message for the right audience. And it's important to realize that that is very important if your goal is to make the thing happen as fast as possible. Right. Well, I want to make this thing happen as fast as possible, too, even though I don't really know what exactly is in door number two. But uh, if I were to, let's say, know what it was or all of us knew, I don't think this experience would necessarily be what it is either, if that makes sense. Like just the idea that you don't really know what well, exactly is going to happen in well, terms of certain humanity. I like that. I think uncertainty is an exciting and desirable feature of life and that 
an indefinite lifespan is is what we have. And it, human beings are the best problem solvers I know of in existence, unless there's aliens or something that are better at it and we can learn from them somehow, or hopefully they're benevolent if we ever meet them. But we are it. We are what we know. And so unknown unknowns aside, I think that it's irresponsible to... Uh, like I think like being at peace with your mortality is essential, but I think it's irresponsible to be so to, to not rage against the dying of the light. And I think it's also it's and because it's and it's selfish because just because you're comfortable with death doesn't mean that you should condemn other people to an unnecessarily early death. It's sort of like I saw a video of a family crossing uh, a, it was like a river. And then a flash flood was coming. And then so people were going like, get out, get out, get out. There's a flash flood coming. And then there was a family that was just way too calm. They were like, oh, I'm not going to let other people make me anxious. I'm not going to let these people rush me. Like, I don't like being rushed. I don't like being told what to do, right? Like, I don't trust those people. Like, I trust my family, right? Like, we have our own vibe. This is what we do. And then they just took their time. They got surrounded by water. And they all got thrown off a waterfall and died. And that's what happens when you take your time sometimes. Yeah, I mean, uh, I'm glad that you brought this up because at the core of what we're trying to do uh, at LEAP, I would like to think, is really uh, an altruism and an optimistic view of what humanity can be. And I think that should definitely be part of the message that you, that we communicate, or, you know, you, if you advocate for this, communicate is that if you think about it, it's all very obvious. Like if the pitch is that it's good to live longer, tacitly implicit in that pitch is that life is good or can be good. Right. And that it's something to be preserved and that shouldn't be left out of the message. You know, it's not just because then otherwise people can really demonize people that uh, you know, how many times has someone asked Aubrey de Grey, like, in a way that seems like, oh, do you just want to live forever because you're selfish? You know, when it's like, it's, it's, it's totally not that. And the way that, like, I ask myself this question is like, uh, you know, I have like a lot of these thought experiments that I apply to myself uh, to, to, to hold myself to account, like philosophically to, to check if I'm on the right track, you know. And, and one of them is like, it, it pertains to this in particular, like if I knew a hundred, if someone told me if the Grim Reaper popped up at my doorstep right now and told me like no uncertain terms, like you are going to die when you're 80 years old, QED, nothing you can do about it. Would I change anything that I am doing? And the answer is no. Right. So it's like, that's how you know it's not selfish. You like when you go through like thought experiments like that, it's like, no, the, it's, the, it's the cause that is the thing that matters, not the, its application necessarily to me. If it does apply to me, great. If not, that's not what really matters. You know? Yeah, it's about what we're living for. That's why I hope that a lot more younger people are going to start <laughs> marrying again when the economy is going to become better because that's become a bit of an issue like we talked about before. And as far as uh, going back to Greek mythology goes, there is another piece of Greek mythology about Prometheus and Zeus, how Prometheus was the originator of human beings, and originally these human beings were supposed to be immortal, just like Prometheus was. But Zeus didn't like that, so he made them mortal, and then Prometheus stole the fire of the gods, brought them back to the people, and the fire of the gods, uh, I take it from the uh, reading I did, to mean, and it's an analogy for human technological innovation, how we were able to overcome whatever stressors we had, you know, with the wild animals and the caves and all these elements that we had to fight against in order to get where we are right now, talking on a webcam with very minimum lag. Uh, <laughs> some people are further away from each other. We're both in New York and it's great. It's something that we have other obstacles to fight against now, like being addicted to looking at one's phone or being couch potato. But if we manage to survive all this time from these wild animals, and if we manage to live long enough to this point where our ancestors, the ones who didn't make it, thought, 
you know what, it's fine if I live this amount of time. Oh, I got stung by a bee that's uh, Africanized, and now all of a sudden I'm not alive anymore. That's horrible. That's not, so, that's not the standard we should set for ourselves. Is so that because I'm, of an allergic reaction or something? Oh, sure. I'm, I'm sure they had allergies back then too. But anyway, the point is, is that I'm just really happy that we are here with you, Keith Comito, and you are part of this amazing movement to get people to live longer and enjoy the life that they're living. Thank you. I'm, I'm happy for your appreciation and the support of people like you. And uh, one, you know, I'm not sure if we're nearing the end here, but, but one final message I, w- I would like to kind of put out related to what you just said is that um, this has been a goal of humanity since literally the first thing that's ever been written or the first great work, the Epic of Gil- Gilgamesh. That was all about, you know, a, a king whose who's best friend uh, dies. And, and it's, it's very moving. I recommend everyone to read it. It doesn't take that long. And, you know, you're starting truly from the beginning of literature <laughs> if, if you read that. But, you know, that, that moment is such a key moment where, you know, uh, Enkidu, uh, Gilgamesh's best friend, dies and he holds his body in his arms for like seven days and he he just cannot believe that his friend is gone until like literally like maggots are coming out of his eyes and then it finally like hits him like he is gone and you know and then he just realized he's like this he's like this there's no way that this cannot be a bad thing it whatever rationalization i make is not better than having enkidu here by my side we have to stop this right so he he goes on this quest and what I find so inspiring personally is that we right now are in this weird, special, magical moment of human history where we're, you know, with CRISPR and things like this, up until now, you essentially, in all ways, just have to take the dice roll that was given to you. But we have the ability now to potentially alter the genetic dice rolls or, you know, change to to take the reins of your own evolution, right? Now, how we want to do that, when we want to do that, that's a societal question. But I want it to be stated that this is a unique period in history. And everybody watching, your viewers, you, me, you know, uh, I'm not saying I believe in some sort of teleology or plan for the universe, you know, given to us by a guy with a beard. But like, stand back and recognize that, you know, in a weird way, we're blessed right now. We're in this magical period where you and I can change the whole game of humanity. Uh, and that's super inspiring in my opinion. So I want to you know, really enforce that, that don't take it for granted. Like you live in the age of miracles and you can perform miracles. Now it's up to us to determine what those miracles should be, but don't take it for granted. This, it's amazing what we're potentially on the cusp of right now. I love that. I love that. Thank you so so much. Thank you very much. And with that, we shall bid you guys adieu. Uh, Please like, comment, subscribe, and don't forget to click the bell for more updates. Take care, guys.